Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is another day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad therein. We are so excited to be coming to you tonight with our Christian education lesson. Let's go to the throne of grace. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your divine providence. We thank you for your divine protection and the fact that you allowed us to see another day. Oh, Lord, we thank God that it has been the way it was. Now, God, as we prepare to go into the learning experience in this Christian education session, oh, Lord, use me in whatsoever way you see fit. I am your instrument. Play me in whatsoever key you so desire. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in our sight. Touch everyone who watch us live or who views later, open their hearts and their minds, that they may receive your word, your will, your way, to acknowledge you in all thy ways. Oh Lord, and let you guide and direct our paths, to lean not to our own understanding, but accept your word, your will, and your way. Giving you all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' mighty name we do pray. Amen. Tonight, beloved, we are going to delve into the subject of Christology. Uh, we're going to explain Christology and give you preferably a working knowledge so that you know uh, what it means and its significance and then how do we apply it. So again, this Christian education lesson is on the subject of Christology. Theology, my brothers and my sisters, is the study of God. And inside theology is the concept of Christology. Uh, from, it comes from the Greek word Christios, and as the study of Christ, which is the branch that concerns Jesus Christ. Uh, just as I've taught earlier in the process, um, I try to simplify it by saying we as Christians, we practice what is known as a resurrection religion, meaning that we believe that because he not only was crucified, died and buried, but because of this resurrection, we have the right to restoration unto God and eternal life. Uh, so the term resurrection religion is to explain and, and part of this, beloved, is so that we know it's important, it's vital to know what you believe and why you believe it. So these Christian education lessons is trying to establish and inform, remind, and establish what we believe and why. And tonight's uh, Christian education, uh, oh, praise the Lord, I can see the comments. Good evening, Sister Mitch uh, Overton. Uh, just if I taught that Christianity is a resurrection religion, to simplify it, the deeper theology here is centered around the belief that number one, Jesus was both human and divine. And number two, as Messiah, uh, his role is both the freeing of the Jewish people from foreign rulers and the prophesied kingdom of God and in the salvation from what would otherwise be the consequences of sin. So the prophets, when they spoke of Jesus Christ, they spoke of the reestablishment of his kingdom. Uh, but, the Jew, but the Jews, they viewed it as a tangible establishment. Oh, good evening, Sister Walisa Smith. Good evening, Sister Evelyn High, and good evening, Sister Barbara Thompson. Let me go left for a minute. I'm excited because we weren't sure whether or not I was going to be able to see the comments. So I'm so glad I can see them. So now I get to say this. If you have questions as I teach, post them in the comments and I can answer them because I can see them. Okay. So the Jews, when they would hear the prophecy, their interpretation of the prophecy was that he was going to reestablish their kingdom here on earth right now. And when I say right now, as we follow the four canonized Gospels, the three synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John, uh, when, when they would see Jesus during his second year, a year of popularity, culminating to when he entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, 
their expectation was for him to overthrow the Roman government and establish the earthly kingdom where we have the benefit of hindsight. Uh, we know that that kingdom to fulfill the promises made to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob and David is in the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Uh, we as Gentiles, we gain the benefit of inclusion. Uh, the earliest Christian writers uh, gave several titles to Jesus, such as the Son of Man, Son of God, the Messiah, and from the Greek word kryos, uh, and all of these was taken from Hebrew scripture. Beloved, there's two opposing themes, and I need you to know what the thought process is uh, were so that you can be aware of them. The two opposing themes from scholarly uh, disciplines is number one, is that Jesus as a pre-existent figure who becomes human and then returns back to God. The second one is called adoptionism. And the belief of adoptionism is that Jesus was human and he was adopted by God, either through his baptism, his crucifixion or his resurrection. So let me make this plain right now. Oh, bless you, uh, Brother Terry Reese. So good to see you. Um, we believe in theme one, that Jesus uh, was divine, uh, that he came down in human form and then he returned back to human form. Now, Bishop don't want you to take just my word for it. You know how we do, we go to the word of God. So again, we believe in theme one, that Jesus was a pre-existent figure who became human, was sacrificed, and then returned back to God. So the first scripture we're going to look at is Genesis, the book of Genesis chapter one. Book of Genesis chapter one. And we're gonna look at verse 26. Genesis, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. So again, in verse 26, and God said, let us make man. So from the aspect of the Trinity, we know who was present was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is one of the scriptures, beloved, that let us know that Jesus was there. And then from there, we're going to go to the gospel as recorded by St. John. St. John chapter one, very familiar scripture, but we're going to take a, a deeper look at it. In John chapter one, verses one through three says, in the beginning was the word, and that that's trans, the, word, the word is translated from the Greek logos. And in your Bible is capitalized because it is a proper noun slash name. So in the beginning was the word, the logos is Jesus Christ. And the word was with God and the word was God. So when John starts his gospel with this verse in the beginning, that goes back to Genesis chapter one, verse 26 in the discussion, let us make man that lets us know john is saying yes i have a special revelation about that because he was there in the beginning he was with god and he was god and then verse two the same was in the beginning with god so john here reinforces reestablishes the point that the word jesus christ with the god the son was there in the beginning and it says all things were by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That lets us know that he had a hand in creation. And then we drop down to verse seven. And verse seven says, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. And if you notice in your Bibles, and if you don't have them now, uh, look as soon as you can, you'll notice the word light is capitalized because once again, it's referring to the person and the person is in the person of Jesus Christ. The same came for witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. It, it, and you see that in verse six, when verse six says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
It refers to John the Baptist. And then he goes, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light where the light of every man that cometh into the world. Uh, now let's drop down to verse 13. Verse 13 says, uh, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So these scriptures, my brothers and my sisters, give us uh, the fact that Jesus Christ was not a human who was adopted to God, but he was there in the beginning. So the, so one thing that we want to, to gain and we want to receive from uh, the study of Christology is know that you believe that, Christ, that Jesus the Christ was there in the beginning and he was made flesh, came down, dwelt among us. Let's go back to Matthew. Let's look at Matthew chapter one, verse 23. Matthew chapter one, verse 23, um, and the angel is speaking here and he says in verse 23, he says, he's talking about the prophecy. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So when Mary is in, engaged in conversation with the angel, the angel is letting her know God is using you to fulfill the prophecy, to fulfill, watch the word I'm gonna use, to fulfill the promise that I'm going to, I have already laid out a plan of restoration. So from resurrection, we gain restoration. And God saw it from when Adam first sinned. And so the provision was made that we could be restored through his death, burial, and resurrection. So when he discusses this with Mary and he lets her know that God has found favor in you and, 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 and let me go left for a minute. It's a joy, it's a blessing and it's God's favor whenever he uses us. It, it's not anything that we've done that we deserve to be used, but we're being used through God's favor. And that has nothing to do with your title but it has everything to do with God chooses to use you and whatsoever capacity he see fit. So one of the things that we gain as from Christ as an example is the fact that we find we want to make ourselves in the words of the song available to you so that we can be found meat for the master's use. He says, Hail Mary, full of grace. Uh, he finds favor in you. And so we, we should not take it lightly when God uses us in whatsoever capacity he so uses, it's more to his usage than just preaching and teaching and singing and playing. Here, we see that God finds favor to use this young girl as a vessel to carry the Messiah. So beloved, we want to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, but also so that he finds favor to use us. Let's go to Luke. The gospel as recorded by Luke chapter one. And we're gonna look at verse 34. Luke chapter one, verse 34. It says, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? In other words, Mary's a virgin, she's never, physically been with the man and verse 35 and the angel answered and said unto her the holy ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of god so in in plain english mary's basically saying how can i have a baby and i've never been intimate with a man and the angel responds is that the intimacy is going to come from the Holy Ghost. So through the intimacy of the Holy Ghost, God is going to plant something in you that's going to be deemed a holy thing. And it, 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 it comes that way, my brothers and my sisters, because the man supplies the DNA and the gender. The man 
the father supplies the blood. So with it being God himself, that means God is supplying the DNA and God is supplying the blood. And it is through this blood that we are able to be redeemed. And then down to verse 40, it says, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. For, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? Now watch the, watch the, the timetable of what happens here. Her cousin Elizabeth hears the voice of Mary and by virtue of what's inside of Mary, the Bible says that the babe leaps in her womb. That babe in her womb is John the Baptist. And it says, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And then because she's filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit reveals unto her that the babe that Mary is carrying is her Lord. So we have to make sure that we're able to gain the information from this and understand that because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit gives us a power of discernment. Now, there it is. Remember, the upper room has not happened yet, but because Jesus is present. Oh, I'm getting happy. Y'all don't pay me no mind. Even in his mother's womb, Jesus is demonstrating power. Because of his presence, the babe in Elizabeth's womb shouts for joy, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Ghost. Beloved, I, remember, we told you we want to make this practical. So don't underestimate that things happen when Jesus is present. And even now, that while he sits on the right hand, who did he send as our comforter? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. What happened today, beloved, is things happen when the Holy Spirit is present. Look at what happens in church service when there's evidence that the Holy Ghost is present. Movement happens, things shift, people get healed, people get delivered when the Holy Spirit is present. And because your body should be the living sacrifice and it should be the temple of the Holy Ghost, that means you should carry something in you that can shift the atmosphere. It should be something in you that when you pray over your grandchildren, things happen. When you pray over your children, things happen. When you pray over your house, you reset the atmosphere. Yes, beloved, because if you have the Holy Ghost in you, you can drive out what you need to drive out. The presence of the Holy Ghost, even here in Luke chapter one, God allows us to learn that things happen when the Holy Ghost is present. Amen. Let's go to Matthew, back to Matthew chapter three. This is gonna be a familiar scripture. You've heard this before. Let's go to Matthew chapter three, verse 15. It says, and Jesus answering said unto him, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, let me back up to verse 14 so you know what's going on. Uh, but John forbid him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me. What happened is Jesus is now at the river Jordan and he's coming, he's presenting himself to be baptized of John. And John is saying this because we remember, I just read the fact that when Jesus was in his mother's womb, John leaps for joy in his mother's womb because he knows who's in his mother's cousin's belly. So because of this, this knowledge didn't go away. So John is basically saying, how can I baptize you? I need you to baptize me. But look what he says in verse 15. He says, suffer it to be so now, for th thus it becometh us to feel, fulfill all righteousness. And this is a component of Christology, the fact that Jesus in his natural form also serves as our example. So he's letting John know, I have to do it to show them they must do it. And it says, then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out the water and lo, the heavens were opened to him. 
and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. For those who are wondering about the Trinity of God, here in these two voices, you see the Trinity present. You see Jesus in physical form, the spirit descends like a dove and you hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God gives his son an endorsement for the people to hear. So that later on, when people want to not be sure or, or, or maybe uh, be squeamish or question it, God is saying, here's my cosign, here's my stamp of approval, here's my endorsement that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the, one of the terms I want you to understand tonight, my brothers and my sisters, is the word, the term preeminence preeminence. That means Jesus was there from the beginning. And then there's another term I want you to learn tonight. It's called hypostatic. Hypostatic union. That just means that's the two natures of Christ, one human and one divine. They're united uh, with neither confusion nor division. He's a heavenly God in an earthly body, hypostatic union. So in essence, my brothers and my sisters, Christology, uh, it literally means the understanding of Christ and is the study of the nature. And when I say nature, that's the person of Jesus Christ and the work, that's his role in salvation. So I've told you this before, Jesus is his name and Christ is his title. Jesus was his name, Emmanuel, God with us. That's his name, but Christ was his title, and that's Messiah. And it is the study of Jesus Christ's humanity and divinity and the relation between the two aspects and the role he plays in salvation. So let me break some stuff down for you uh, in the study of Christology. Uh, one of them is called ontological Christology. And that just means that we analyze the nature or being of Jesus Christ, ontological Christology. And then there's another one, the second of three is called functional Christology. And that functional Christology is when one analyzes the works of Jesus Christ. And then you have a third one that's called soteriological, soteriological. Christology, and that analyzes the salvific uh, standpoints of Christology, which means his role in our salvation. And there's different approaches that people approach Christology. One of them is called Christology from above. And that means uh, it refers to the aspects of his divinity. And then you get the names such as Lord, Son of Man, the preexistence of Christ, and logos, which is the word that he was called in John chapter one, verse one, when it says in the beginning was the word. Now I give you all of that. Let's Now let's cut it up so we can eat it. And let's look at the practical application uh, of what I call the working knowledge. Because beloved, it's not, it's, it's not enough to be able to quote terms, but be able to say, what does this mean to me? How did this apply to me? How did this apply to my everyday living? How does this apply to my growth and my development? Well, one of the things is that we are saved through not our belief in God, but our belief in what God did when he so loved us that he sent his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's John 3, 16. So we need to understand that our salvation is not based simply on our belief in God, but it's based on our belief in God and what he did. So how, how Bishop, how is this practical? Number one, tell yourself Jesus was there from the beginning. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning, God created. Let us make. So Jesus, we believe that Jesus was there from the beginning. Now, uh, 
there's some people might have gotten tripped up uh, with the term salvific or salvation. Um, so I'm going to give you an easy breakdown of the salvific process. Uh, when it was Abel, Abel during the time of Cain and Abel, uh, they sacrificed one lamb for one person. Uh, at the time of Cain and Abel, and in the beginning, they sacrificed one lamb for one person. If we fast forward to when the children of Israel are in Egypt and they were getting ready for their exodus, uh, the last plague, they were given specific instructions and it was one lamb per household. Remember, they're instructed to kill the lamb, take his blood, put his blood on the doorpost. And when the angel of death comes, if he sees the blood, he will pass over that house. So it changes from one lamb per one person to one lamb per one household. Uh, but in the Sinai desert is one lamb for one nation. The one lamb was slain for the one nation, but on a hill called Calvary, it was one lamb for one world. And that one lamb, that lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, that lamb, the lamb of God was Jesus Christ. So that lamb was sacrificed, that lamb was slain, and it is his blood that provides us with salvation. So it goes from one lamb per person to one lamb for one world. That is the process, the salvific process that because of the lamb of God, our sins have been taken away and we are provided with a way of salvation. Number three, uh, Jesus was human in, in his humanity. He served as our example, but watch this beloved. He also showed his authenticity of his humanity. Bishop, why do we say uh, we, he showed his uh, authenticity of being human? Because he demonstrates his humanity. Number one, he got hungry. We know after he fasted 40 days in the wilderness, uh, even though the devil tempted him, uh, he was still hungry. And after the temptation, uh, he was ministered to. In the word of God, it talks about when they went on the Sabbath, and they got corn. So we see uh, Jesus eating. So we know that he got hungry. We know that he got sleepy uh, uh, because when he told them, let us pass over to the other side in Mark chapter four, when the storm shows up, we find when Peter goes to the hinder part of the ship, Jesus is asleep on a pillow. So we know that he gets sleepy. He, he gets tired. That's why uh, he would steal away into the mountain, we, we know that he needed to rest. So we know he got tired. We know that he got weak because in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, I wish that his cup would pass over from me. So we know that he demonstrates he weak. We know that he got sad and cried because the Bible tells us after he entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, well, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He, he, he was sad over the state of Jerusalem. We know he got angry because when he goes in the temple and he sees the people, uh, the merchants cheating the people, the Bible declares he got angry and he turns over the tables and say, this is a house of prayer. You're making it a den of thieves. So we know he got angry. We know he got frustrated because when he comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And the man said that I brought my son who is a lunatic to your disciples, they couldn't heal him. And he says, oh ye perverse generation. He, he got frustrated. Uh, we know he got disappointed. Uh, and and we, we know that he demonstrates these humanly traits to let us know that he was human. So that just as he got angry, we can get angry, but the lesson is be angry, but sin not. We know that, you know, we sing the song, Trouble in My Way, I Have to Cry Sometimes. So we know that these things will happen. And we know the, the validity and authenticity of his humanity is based on he demonstrates human traits. 
He demonstrates love. He demonstrates compassion. How many times the word of God says he looked on the people and had compassion for them. He ministered to them from a place of compassion. He feeds the multitude in the wilderness from a place of compassion. So, so we know that he not only did he serve as our example, but he served from a place of humanity. And then number four, he makes intercession for us. We, we, we hear this term often that he sits at the right hand of the Father. And the way that we know he makes intercession for us is the fact that we get what we get, not because we deserve it, but we, we do it because God does it because of him. He, he, he says, uh, I'm so glad to see that. Okay to get angry, but it's how you respond in the end is the key. It's the place of how you react is the key. Uh, that a uh, great question, Sister Walisa Smith, uh, because people, would, when you change the meaning, they, they want to throw in your faith. But you're supposed to be saved. I can be saved and angry. But what we have in our growth and development, uh, it's the response is based on our self-discipline. Uh, I never thought about Jesus. Hey, yes, he did. So, yeah, back to Sister uh, Walisa Smith's question. So, and, and let me say this, even in that, that's a growth process. We have to grow to where, watch what I say, not so much how we respond, but where we respond from. Let me say that again. Uh, when, you, when you ask, it's how you respond. If my answer to that question is not so much of how you respond, where do you respond from? You know, and notice, remember, let's go back to the example of when Jesus got angry. Jesus didn't get angry and say, hallelujah, now you're all so wrong. No, Jesus did something. He flipped some tables over, which lets us know that because of his anger, he did something. So don't let people uh, throw this, this dark cloud over you because you get angry and you throw something. It's, it's still a growth and development process. And if we're being real tonight, uh, if you're not careful, when you're angry and you respond from just the emotionalism of anger, you're going to do some stuff and say some stuff you don't mean. And, and the growth and development is not so much you do something that you regret. It's where do you respond from? Jesus was so upset, he flipped some tables over. Uh, I've seen people get so resp uh, so angry that they punch a hole in the wall. Okay, what's what's the uh, how do we fix that? I punch a hole in the wall. Oh well, I got to fix some sheetrock. It's better than punching a person. Are you? If I'm praying this makes sense to y'all. I I'd rather hurt the wall than hurt a person. I I'd rather say something and kick something than to say something to hurt a person that I can't repair. Because I'm telling you this, beloved, from uh, from from personal experience, once you say it, you can't take it back. And all of us, I I I carried the weight for years of saying something from a place of emotionalism, where because of where it came from, it, it wasn't so much of saying it because I'm angry, but it's where it came from, and and I you have to make sure that you don't channel it towards somebody. So I said something that I didn't mean, but once I said it, I couldn't take it back. If I flip over a table, so be it. If I said, well, darn, it is what it is. But if I, if I, if I, you, if I channel it at somebody, that's what I mean by where you have to be mindful of, of what place, where uh, you channel that from. And that's, and in the growth and development, one of the things that we strive to grow as Christians is we have to be mindful of what place it comes from. And when you say something to somebody you really don't mean, that's because you reacted from the wrong place. Uh, and we're all guilty of it. You have a bad day at work, you snarl at your spouse. Now you feel bad because it wasn't your spouse's fault. That's what I mean by learning to be mindful of what place we act from. So in other words, what are you saying, Bishop? I process the fact that I'm angry, I'm upset. Now, 
in my growth and development, what place do I allow that expression to come from? Like, like another one that we don't talk about enough in the church is stress. What place do we deal with the stress from? And, and what happens is our church folks get real judgmental when people are wrestling with something. And sometimes the reason why they're wrestling with something is because they have to learn to respond from a different place. If I get upset at work and I don't want to go to work and, and, and get postal, and, and, and that's a good point, Sister Walisa Smith, we are held to a higher regard. We're, high, we're held to a higher standard. But part of that is our growth and our development. So once again, the point I was trying to make is so I don't go to work and shoot everybody. I go home and have me a stiff drink. Now, people who want to be judgmental about that when the truth of the matter is, it's not the sin to drink, it's the sin to get drunk. And that may be a step in their growth and development. And they, move, they may move from having a drink of Hennessy to getting a cup of hot tea and a candle. It's part of their growth and development. They're doing better than your judgmental behind because you coming home cussing out your kids. It ain't the kids' fault. Displaced aggression is a trick of the enemy. Let me say that again. Displaced aggression is a trick of the enemy where you're mad at somebody and you take it out on somebody else. That's displaced aggression. Jesus flipped the tables over because they were the very ones that was doing it. Jesus sees a tree, a fruit tree that's not bearing fruit and he curses it. The tree deals with the consequences of his actions. So one of the ways that we grow and develop is we have to learn things like displaced aggression. We have to learn the danger of narcissistic behavior. We have to learn those things. It ain't just about hallelujah, hallelujah, see, and speaking in tongues and running and shouting. Growth and development, watch the word I'm going to use. And this is the piece I want you to get from Christology, how it applies to you. The whole man, body, soul, spirit. Jesus was human and holy. He, he was human and divine. We are body, soul, spirit. And you have to understand that you have to be healthy, three parts. Three parts. The lesson that he teaches us. He teaches us stress management. He do, Bishop? Yes, he does. How did Jesus deal with his stress management? A quiet place. Send the disciples ahead, goes up into the mountain in his quiet place. Ooh, that was powerful. Um, I just saw something. I'm, I got to back up. Um, Sister Walisa Smith, that's why it's vital who's in your circle. Remember, Jesus called, he had a multitude. He sent out 70. He called 12, but he had three in his inner circle. So you have to understand, uh, just as you made uh, that point, uh, yeah, because the three parts are vital uh, because people should be able to minister to you and understand you on three levels. I, I, I'll get to that in, in relationship one-on-one, and the Holy Spirit's gonna let me do that soon, where I can teach you about your attraction should be three levels. Your compatibility has to be on three levels. I got another comment that, that's powerful. Um, uh, in the current ministry that I attend, and it's raising red flags for it's not what it said, how it said, for it may be taken out of context. Uh, yes, that, that is powerful, uh, Minister Reeves, because watch how I'm going to say this to address that. Um, I can't feed a puppy grown, grown dog food. I can't, I have to feed. That's why when he asked Peter three times, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. So it's not just what we say, but the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to say it the way it can be received. One of the things I like to use in the analogy, I use in teaching and preaching, I use it as a sandwich. And you'll hear me say this often, let me cut it up so that we can eat it. That's because some saints are mature enough they can bite the sandwich but some of them are like y'all grandbabies you cut the sandwich up in little squares and you cut the crust off of it you, you make it easier for them to digest so minister reeves one of the things we as shepherds we as apostles we as bishops we as pastors 
we have to have the ability to present the food so that they can digest it. Because if they can't digest it, they can't receive it and they can't apply it. Uh, Sister Barbara Thompson, a quiet place is powerful. And, and, and you should grow to the point where your, your secret, your, your, when they talk about the prayer closet, your prayer closet, it don't have to be a physical closet, but it should always be a quiet place. And, and sometimes as you grow, you learn the value of a dark, quiet place. Because then God can show you some things you can't see when the, when the atmosphere is not so busy. Uh, that's one of the things that should happen. And y'all forgive me, I'll do more teaching for that next year about what you should accomplish in the prayer and supplication and penance during the season of Lent. We focus a lot on giving up something and fasting. And that's a good thing. But like I said, one of the things the Holy Spirit dealt with me this year about he, either this year, I don't. it ain't so much about what I want you to give up. It's about what I want you to do. I want you to spend more intimate time with me. So that was my focus this year for my Lent. It was to carve out those quality times and, and then take my whooping and not complain if God wake me up at 2.20 in the morning to spend 40 minutes with him. If I wake up at 3.45, uh, and here's how kind the Holy Spirit is. When I obeyed and got up at 3.45 and spent that 45 minutes, he let me go back to sleep and still wake up at 7.30 and it felt like I slept all night long. So for me, for Bishop, this Lent season, it was about an intimacy with God. And it made sense because the more intimate time I spent with him, the more he was able to pour into me. So, so don't underestimate the power and importance of a quiet place. Amen. And, and back to Minister Reeves statement, we as leaders, it is, it is extremely important how we feed the flock. And, and, but it, remember relationships are two ways. It, it's, it's not just me feed the flock, but that sheep has to also be receptive to it. Uh, it's not like, Christ, like, okay, out of love. Uh, yes, Lord. Um, that's big, Mr. Reeves, because love should be the foundation. Love should be the, the, the driving factor in everything we do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, at the end, Paul says, I can show you a more excellent way. And then we get 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, which is an entire chapter devoted to love, the the traits of love, the attributes of love. Uh, and, it's, and it's for everybody from the bishop all the way down to the baby saint. And he closes, he says, now abided faith, hope, charity, these three. Paul says, your three things, your, your three, your ABCs in Christianity is faith, hope, and charity. And he says, the greatest of these is charity. And when we quote John 3, 16, he so loved us. So he expects if God is love and he so loved us, the Bible tells us if we don't have love, we don't have God. Jesus does what he does because his father loved us. He loved us and he loved the father. So when we talk about the practicality of Christology, it's what did he do because he loved us? If our mouth says we love God, how do our actions align? Remember, three parts, body, soul, spirit, with, with three. So in other words, God's, God expects us to love him on three levels, by what we say, what we do, and what we feel. Let me say that again. We demonstrate our love for God by what we say, what we do, and what we feel, and not necessarily in that order. Because of the magnitude I feel for God, it's going to cause me to demonstrate my love for God with the attitude of gratitude. Let me say that again. Because I feel love for God because he first loved us, I'm going to demonstrate with my actions, but my attitude also comes into play. 
I don't come into the house of worship like I'm doing him a favor. I enter his gates with thanksgiving. I'm appreciative. I enter his courts with praise because I realize I owe him because of all he's done. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So there's a roadmap. When we worship God, when we serve God, he said, how do we do it? In spirit and in truth. And the one thing he shouldn't have to say is in love, spirit and truth. Because the love's already supposed to be there. Because if I've been born again, I possess a love for him. Because out of my place of humility comes my repentance. Out of my place of gratitude comes my acceptance. And then the manifestation comes through my reciprocated love because he first loved me. So I believed, uh, I, I believed in my heart. I confess with my mouth. But in the transformation is a love based on gratitude. Man, he loved me when I didn't love myself. And that love should grow daily. How, let me say this. How many of you that's watching tonight as you got older? Good evening, Sister Betty Gray. How many of you who got older realize and have a greater appreciation for who your parents are and what they did when you got grown and the magnitude of what they did and how they did it? means more to you. It, it, it was a joy to hear my kids say, Daddy, we didn't really appreciate it. We didn't realize all we had to do, to do is turn on the switch and lights came on. So how many of you, as you got older, gained a greater appreciation for the sacrifices your parents made, for what they actually did so that you can be where you are now? That same aspect should apply with you spiritually. As you grow in Christ, you should sometimes get overwhelmed that, man, God looked out for me when I wasn't trying to live right. I, I, when I went in the hospital and the doctor didn't know, God knew. See, so when I talk about a doctor who's never lost a case, patient, that ain't what I'm not saying what churchy people say. Bishop saying it because he doesn't been there. When I talk about a lawyer never lost a case, Bishop ain't talking about what church folks say, Bishop is talking about been there. When I say bread in a starving land, it means there was a time in my life when I didn't know where I was going to get my next meal from, and God made a way. Shelter in a time of a storm. When I did not know what I was going to do, when I lost my earthly father, God became the shelter. So, at the more I grow in Christ, the greater my appreciation for God grows, the greater my love grows, because the older I get, the more I can see. Like I said, you know, kids don't understand bills, but when they get older, it makes sense. You know what? You know, we don't let, we, we try not to let my mom cook a whole lot because we were growing boys. And if anybody on here tonight have grown boys and growing children that play athletics, we were eating machines. And I, I, I can't do, I can't eat now like I did then. Back then, I could sit down and eat a whole bag of Doritos. I could dust off a box of cereal in a mixing bowl. And now I struggle with the snack pack. But, but I realize how much feeding, watch, somebody going to see me and I'm gone. How much feeding my mother had to do to get me to a certain place. And, 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 and that, true believers, is why you're blessed to have a bishop as your pastor, because you have someone who has the ability to feed you on a level you need to grow. Because you've heard us say this in church, as he elevates me, you're being elevated. Because now you're being able to be fed on a different level. Mama knew she needed to cook more grits. She needed to cook more eggs. She had to cook bacon and sausage. Well, the same thing with you spiritually. When you get to a certain point, can't any and everybody feed you? You need somebody who can feed you so you can grow and develop. Now I'm going to make some folk mad. That's why we were healthy 
and these kids sickly and can't go outside and play because we was eating grits and eggs and sausage. We was eating meatloaf and mashed potatoes with and rice and gravy. You giving them babies oodles and noodles. You give them bad food and why they and wonder why they're not growing and developing. We played like it was a job. They want to sit in the house and play PlayStation. You can't expect them to exert energy that you haven't given them the food for. Ooh, I helped somebody tonight. Let me say that again. You cannot expect them to be active and you don't feed them to give them the energy to be active. You can't expect church folks to grow and develop and all you give them is spiritual euphemisms and prosperity preaching. They need a balanced diet. They need a balanced diet of the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. They need a balanced diet. Remember the vegetables we didn't like? None but the righteous shall see God. They need a balanced diet of you can't come in here playing, for if you worship him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. They need a balanced diet of stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has already made you free, and then you can tell them, I'm the head, not the tail. I'm the borrower, not the lender. I'm the lender, not the borrower. Balanced diet. And through that balanced diet, they will grow and they will develop so that they can handle strong meat. Paul said, y'all should be on strong meat. Y'all still on milk. And one of the reasons why we're in the position and the condition we're in as the body of Christ is we as pastors, we as leaders, are not developing our folks to handle strong meat. We're trying to entertain them. We want to give them performance. We don't want to offend them. This ain't for everybody. This is for those who want to be who God wants them to be. So I pray, my brothers and my sisters, that you have an understanding and you know what it means when you hear the term Christology. You know what it means when you hear the term preeminence, that he was, he was here then, he's here now, and he will be here forevermore. Or let me say it like this. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And we understand um, that through his death, his burial, his resurrection, we are heirs and joint heirs. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says, if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Baby, you got to go through something to get something. And you can't be glorified being on milk. It takes strong meat. Amen. We thank you so much for each and every one of you. I thank God for your questions, for your comments. I pray that the comments and the answers that I gave was a help and a blessing to each of you. So glad to have you all. Uh, we thank each and every one of you who support us uh, financially, spiritually. Continue to pray for us, to lift us up. Uh, those who uh, will continue or those who will start to support us, uh, go to our Facebook page, True Believers FGBC-GA, you can contribute financially for, to us through GiveLify, Cash App, and Zelle. Uh, continue to lift us up in prayer. Uh, bless you so much. Uh, each of you, Sister Barbara Thompson, Mother Evelyn High, uh, Sister Walisha Smith, Sister Me, uh, Amelia Overton, uh, thank you all so much. I'm honored and privileged uh, to come to you. I, I pray that it helping you to learn to grow and develop. That is my desire. That's my goal. Uh, he don't want this, but I'm going to give a shout out to my nephew, uh, Brother Christopher Cole. Thank you so much for everything you're doing to help us to expand this ministry. Um, everything you do, nephew, man, I love you, proud of you. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, y'all make sure when y'all see him on Sunday, show him some love uh, because he does with, just because Uncle asked. Again, um, continue we're striving to go levels up um i don't do a whole lot of focus on on get on people's giving I, i'm a big proponent of matthew 6 33 seek ye first the kingdom 
of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added. If God gets your heart, he got everything else. Uh, if, if, if this is good spiritual word for you, um, don't try to eat for free. Don't shout on credit. Be willing to sow into this because one thing I can tell you that this ministry is good ground. If you sow in this, you will reap a harvest. May God continue to bless you and keep you is our sincere and earnest prayer. God bless you.